The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tony D'Angelo's PM Coast to Coast. Now, here's your host, Tony D'Angelo. And a very good afternoon to you wherever you may be. This is Tony D'Angelo, and this is Tony D'Angelo's PM Coast to Coast. And man, have I got a guest for you today. The lovely and talented actress, artist, and author, Belinda Belaski. A long career in Hollywood, many, 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 many different roles. Now an author, still an actress, and now an artist. And we're going to have a great time talking to Belinda. So uh, I'm just going to meet her just like you guys are. And I'm just so excited about the fact that she's here. And it's always great to chat with people from various endeavors on this show. And uh, I personally can't wait. And I'll tell you, when you have this kind of person and when you have this kind of excitement happening, it makes you really happy, if you're me, that you're able to do this show. And it's really happy when you got some great bump music like this. This is one of the classics. Drives me absolutely crazy on these stupid networks today where these pea brains that are running them don't play the intros. Man, you got to get the intros. Jimmy Cantor in Chicago, this is Beginnings. We're going to be beginning something right here, right now, right after this. Fasten your seatbelts. Today's Valentine beer, crisp, clean, naturally more refreshing. The only beer, golden mellow from the golden harvest. This is the golden harvest, grains carefully grown and selected. And this is the golden harvest, costlier premium hops that are mellowed two weeks longer on the vine than the hops in other beers. So pour a cold and golden Valentine from Valentine's Golden Harvest Time. Refreshing and mellow every time. Golden mellow, Valentine, Valentine beer. Next time you're in your favorite tavern, better make it Valentine, America's finest since 1840. And good afternoon to everyone along the stations up and down the coast of the comfortably zoned radio network out of Alameda, California. I am so pleased this afternoon to be joined by the lovely, talented, and delightful Belinda Belaski. She is an actress. She is an artist. She is a... Great person to be around. We were having some fun chatting before we got on the air. And uh, she's also going to be an author, too. Belinda has a long career in film and television and stage and uh, has uh, been doing this for uh, her life. Belinda, it's a delight. Thank you for spending some time with me today, my dear. Very nice. Thank you, Tony. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I mean, uh, we were chatting before we got on, and I was talking about the humidity in the East Coast, and <laughs> it, it's either, you know, it's either like we freeze, depending on whatever time you're here during the year, or you sweat with the humidity, and we were saying that in California, you guys get the dry heat. Yeah, it's hot, but the nights, I mean, I love the California nights. They're nice. Yeah, and- it's a little more moderate weather here. It's between, you know, 70 and 80, which is nice. Yeah, and uh, it's like, are you uh, living in the greater L.A. area these days? I'm right in Hollywood. It's, it's, where I am is so quiet. You know, you'd think being in the heart of Hollywood, it might be loud and everything, but it's just the most quiet neighborhood, and I love being here. It's so convenient. Well, you know, you kind of get that mix there between, how could I put it, if you come down off the mountains, you got the real busy thing, you got the Sunset Strip, but as you go up in the mountains, you think, this, uh, I, I'm not in Los Angeles. It's the most incredible thing. Right. It's very beautiful. It really is. And the amount of trees just on my street alone is, you know, 
kind of miraculous. <laughs> California, every time you turn around, there's a new tree right next to you, you know. It's just so diverse here. And I, I, you know, always something's always in bloom, and it's just always quite lovely. Yeah, it, it, it really truly is. And, uh, I'm a native, so what can I say? You know? Yeah, now let's talk about that. Now, you <laughs> grew up, um, you, you were born there. Is Did you ever want to do anything else other than be an actress? No, actually, I was born here. My father was a jockey, so we traveled every three months of our lives with the racetrack season, many times just the California circuit, but also, you know, he went to, he rode the Derby and Aqueduct and all the, Florida and New York and up and down that coast, too. Um, but I, when I was five years old, I heard this voice in the hall of our home when I got up one morning by mm -hmm. myself. I was walking, just going to say good morning to my parents or something. And as I was heading down the hall, I heard this, literally heard the, the voice. And it said to me that I was going to be a, an actress and that my life was going to be about communication. And yeah. I said, okay. And that was kind of it. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. I, I mean, I don't, that, uh, every time I hit a corner in my life, I chose my career and my, you know, what this voice had told me my life was going to be about. And so I was always very um, directed and uh, full intentioned and, you know, was on drama scholarships from seventh grade on and, you know, uh, just heading down a direct path to where I thought I was meant to be. I'll, I'll tell you, man, boy, I, I envy you and I envy people like you who are like, this is what I'm going to be. You know, I and see that now. You know, I was very fortunate in that because I see so many young people. You know, I had a school, acting school for kids, uh, called Baby's Kids, and a lot of kids came in when they were four, and now they're like 20, and some of them are even 30, you mm -hmm. know, and I've watched them go through these different phases in their lives, you know, and I see that without some inner direction, they're just flailing. They really don't know where to land, you know, and they're kind of lost, and end up just kind of getting a job and not really being driven. I was so driven. I was. I had to get where I said I was going to be, you know. Yeah, now, uh, where did you go to high school? <laughs> I had, I went to Bishop School in La Jolla, which is, uh, was an all-girls school, and I was there from 7th through 12th grade. So mm -hmm. there were seven years, and saddle, those saddle oxford shoes and blazers, gabardine uniforms, and Etc. I, I understand. <laughs> but, you know, getting to the whole subject of like you knew, you know, like me, myself, I, uh, I masquerade as a trust officer, uh, you know, and as a tax practitioner. Well, I'm, 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 I'm five days a week. Sometimes it turns out to be seven. And then I do this show. And the thing is, <laughs> when I look back, you know, years and years and years and years, I thought, well, do I want to be in accounting or do I want to be in radio? And, you know, Belinda, I still have those struggles. Right now, one's paying the bills. Tough choice. You know, so it's... <laughs> right, well, listen, hey, you know, I mean, who didn't work? You know, we all... I, I mean, I kind of job possible because as an actor, I thought it was important to try every job and that I would be ready for any part that I got. So I was like, okay, I'll do that job. Okay, I don't care about that. I'll do that job. You know, it was to me a sort of practice, you know, for later in life. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so, you know, it was kind of uh, shocking uh, to me when I realized at a certain phase in my life I really didn't want to do this anymore. And, um, that I had done, you know, kind of what I wanted to do. Well, really wasn't ever going to be able to do what I really wanted to do, but I had done enough and that the business itself was changing and to continue to go forward was going to probably not look as good as what was in my past. And that I, you know, just really, I had become a foster parent and mm. I just really didn't want my child growing up in that environment. and wanted to have a much more stable life for her and so I started teaching. I started an acting school and started teaching I understand kids now, which is great. But I also retired from that and started doing something I promised myself as a child because I used to my mother used to find me in the closet drawing in the middle of the night. Um, but I always wanted to be an artist. Well I think that's the expressiveness in you wanting to get out. Well, I think it's true. I think if you're a creative person and you're not doing one thing, you're, you're beating, you know, I'm beating Indian colors or I'm, you know, making wooden plates. Um, 
on a wave, or I'm, you know, I'm always creating something, do you know? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. It's like I, I get into this business now, and it's the sort of thing, and people say to me, you know, it's so unlike what you might do, Tony, over the course of a, you know, a day or a week. I says, no, 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 no. It's very much like what I do because what I try to do with clients and what I try to do with people or, you know, people you try to help on a, you know, even like on a charitable basis, you want to get into them and you want to find out, this is me, what 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 makes you tick? What What's most important to you? What's there? And I know um, there's a parallel between like your business in the theater and acting and mine, which is there's an awful lot of non-people people that just want to like, you know, they're, they're interested in the production, the dollar, the this, the that, and they completely skip over what their subject or what their art is about. And I said, you know, for me it was a very easy transition because, um, you know, it's just getting to what's meaningful to a person and making that happen for them. And then when you can make that happen for them, that, and it's something nobody else can do, then you feel you, you have a right to live another day, if you're me. Yeah, it's true. And teaching is definitely like that. But also, you know, do, doing films back in the day were... It was such a group effort. Everybody was in there punching. Everybody was thrilled to have a job, you know. Everybody was like, I don't care. I'll move, I'll move the camera. Don't worry, you know. Yeah. It wasn't really, you know, like union. It was much more independent. And, and, and all of us loved what we were doing. And just, you know, especially in the Joe Dante films and Paul Bartel and all of those guys were just amazing uh, with their passion for the industry. And, and, and Roger, of course, you know the seed of all their all of their great achievements you know um i mean the love that was there is just not the same anymore there's not really that heartbeat that you know it, it, it's not the same with cgi and sort of everything's distant even your auditions are by your computer or something you know i, I have a, a an assistant who would literally do her voice over auditions on garage band on her phone while sitting in her car at a stoplight <laughs> There's something wrong here, you know. Oh, it'll just take me two seconds. Hang on, and she'll do the audition right there on her phone. And I thought, my gosh, you know. Well, what this has come to, you know, a, a very good friend of of my shows and a very good friend personally for many years is, um, and and you might have bumped into him in your career. Uh, Michael Dante, the actor, were both from the same town in Stanford, Connecticut, and oh. you know, uh, and he um, he echoes many of the same things you do as far as what things were like and how they worked, and it's very funny, and 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 you would really appreciate this. We did a um, a segment um, not uh, not long ago. And uh, one of the people we were working with, actually one of the people, the, the person who was kind enough to allow us the facility to use was um, James B. Harris, the producer-director of Harrison Kubrick, who's 90 years old and who's still doing scripts and on a typewriter. And, uh, you uh, know, the, uh, and, and, and the guy like is... Like Kurt Gordon, you know, just still... Exactly. And you could talk to him, you know, it's like you, you could talk to him yep. for hours on end, but it's mm -hmm. just the thing that he says to me is, we need, and, and he said this very seriously, and I agree with him, he says, where's the character in this business anymore? He says, I used to work with guys like, you know, named Widmark and Dante and Richard Egan. He says, yes. now I can't find anybody <laughs> like that. It's very true. I mean, I worked with the Charlton Heston and Clark Leachman and you know, Michael York and some and Peter Strauss and some pretty amazing yeah. people, do you know what I mean? Human beings and and amazing actors and, and humans at the same time. Now, were you by any chance a Katherine Hepburn fan? Well, of course I was, yes, yeah. but I never met her. Never, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a story which will have people laugh at your, your next, uh, you know, gathering or whatever the case may be, or cocktail party or, you know, whatever sort of thing you, uh, you might be doing. This is an absolutely true story. I was thinking about this yesterday because uh, I was out doing the lawn. I have to do my own lawn because people people don't do these 
uh, they don't work anymore, Belinda. You know, so it's it's very hard to find somebody to help you. So you end up adding that to everything that you do. And I have a very small piece of property in Pineford, Connecticut. It's an acre. You know, so people have 30, 40 <laughs> acres. So yeah, I, right. I could do that's, mine with. That's so nice. How nice. It, it is. It really it is. is. I'm blessed to be here. But um, Catherine Hepburn had a townhouse in New York. Uh, like in the East 80s, and she lived with her sister. And this is like after, um, I believe, uh, Spencer Tracy had passed on. And the family had that property uh, over in uh, Old Saybrook, Connecticut, on the Eastern Shore. And that was, I guess, her parents' house, and it fell to her. I think her brother had committed suicide. She was the sole heir, so she had this wonderful beachfront mansion, uh, which I understand, I think, is now a museum. So she would work in New York during the week, and she would drive herself and her Cadillac all the way up to Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And this went on going into her 80s. I mean, who's going to tell Katie not what to do? So there is a bridge in New Haven, Connecticut called the Quinnipiac River Bridge. It has since been redone, but it is one of the biggest bridge disasters ever in the history of mm. mankind the only poetic justice is the guy that designed it was killed on it it's that bad it's the most hated thing in the world not only that but when you drive when you drove over this thing um, the um, almost invariably if you did it like four or five six times uh, a week or something you'd have a tire blow out it's just mm. the, the, the thing oh was cursed God. so here's Katie she's this is about 1986 or 1987 I think at this time she's like 81 82 years old she's driving over the Quinnipiac River Bridge and bang the Cadillac has a tire blowout so here you are you're Catherine Hepburn <laughs> you're, you're, you're sitting in you know on the Quinnipiac River Bridge cars are passing by and you're like, what do you do? Well, you're Catherine Hepburn. You go out and you change that tire. So yeah, here's yeah. in white gloves, probably. I can see her. Yeah, she pops open the trunk hood. She dra and of course these were not the little spears. These were the big oh ones. My God. She jacks up the car, and all the traffic's there. You know, Miss Hepburn, can we help you? No, I'm fine. You know, I'm fine. <laughs> I've got this truck. I've been doing this for years. And and she put the tire on, and she okay. you know throws the jack back in the car. Boom off. The, I mean, just such an That's incredible. Really funny. Yeah. Story. I mean, funny traffic story. was packed. Uh, up for miles. Oh my God! Yeah, I bet those people still talk about it, you know. But uh, yeah, it's just. I, did you have a favorite actress or a model when you're uh, when you were growing up and you know starting in the business? Oh, I did. I had so many. You know, I mean, I, when I was young, young, I, I was madly in love with Debbie Reynolds and Tammy, all the Tammy movies. You know. Then I got older and I fell in love with movies like. Uh, Bunny Lake is missing, and you know David mm -hmm. and Lisa, <laughs> things like that. And I guess my sense of humor got a little more macabre as I got older and older. But you know, I always like thrillers or, or you know psychological thrillers or that kind of film. Not really horror so much, but you know <laughs> these these kinds of um, whodunit type figure them out things. Now, I, I noticed that you're chronicled in terms of, uh, well, I'm going to use a term which either probably you love or you hate, the, the great sc uh, screen queens, and, and you were there in that list. Um, is, is that a, a genre you really liked, or did you really, you know, wanted Listen, to do? I did 30 years of television, which is unheard of for a woman in Hollywood, okay, and nobody ever mentions it. All they talk <laughs> about are seven movies that I did. Yeah, I know. So, I mean, it's That's horribly unfair. That, that people are unaware of everything else that I did. You know, I did these amazing movies of the week when they first started coming yes. out. And these after-school specials when they, I think I did the very first one for Hanna-Barbera. And, you know, and I did, uh, I did another one with Michael York years later. I mean, I've done a zillion of these things and I... I feel like, you know, as, when people say a screen queen, I go, wait a minute, you missed the rest of my <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> that's my point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh? Yeah, it, exactly. You know, I mean, I, I forever am shocked too, when I go to state conventions, you know, and people just, they know my lines, they know everything about me. They know more about me than I do. Yeah. They only know about those films. They don't know about anything else. And I, I just want to go... Do you have, have any idea how hard it, I auditioned for these different parts and got them? I mean, it was such an ordeal to get parts in television. 
I mean, once you got kind of, you know, two or three parts, yes, you started getting calls in for things, but it was really hard to break in to, I mean, I didn't have any bloodline here, you know. Mm -hmm. I, was, I just came in my van with my dog and my cat, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, started auditioning and got very fortunate to fall into the arms of this, um, you know, this young director. I mean, I, I kind of came when all these young filmmakers arrived. I remember my, after I'd done, I think, Food of the Gods, I'd done Bobby Joe and Cannibal on Food of the Gods, I think, and um, my agent called, and, called me and he said, listen, there are two young filmmakers who are holding auditions and they're both doing individual films, but they're looking for an 18-year-old type young girl and both of them want to meet you, and they're holding the auditions together. So, you know, why don't you go on in and meet them? And I thought, okay, you know. So I went in, and, and I'm sitting there talking to them, and I had brought my book, and I was so serious and passionate about what I was doing. I was showing them pictures from this and that. When one of, this, one of them looked at me and said, oh, my God, you, like, winked at me. I said, what? He said, you winked at me. I said, no, no, no I didn't wink at you. He said, yes, you did. I saw you. I said, no, oh, my God, I did not wink at you. And he said, yes, you did. And he asked the other guy, he said, didn't you see her? She winked at me, right? The other guy didn't want to get involved at all, right? And I, I finally, I slammed my book shut, and I said, you know, you guys want to play, and I want to work. And I turned around and walked out of that audition. Do you know who those two people were? I shudder to think about it. George Lucas. And Brian De Palma. Oh dear. <laughs> there are moments you can't replace, you know. And when you haven't heard of someone before and you they really aren't famous yet, you know, you find yourself in these situations. I was so it was a very princess way of thing to do. I'm actually shocked he didn't cast me, but you know, I, I look back on it and I find it funny that at the time, you know, it was Oh my gosh, you're crushing to see uh, it was Carrie that came out in Star Wars. Now, the thing I think that people, you know, the people that go and they see you in the conventions and things like that and recite the lines to you, uh, and to, they have no idea how sausage gets made in the film industry. Tell us, like, some of the um, audition things. You mentioned you had to audition very hard, but were there, like, roles that you missed, like, just that much, and perhaps they still bother you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember going in to audition for, I think it was Five Easy Pieces, or the movie that came out afterwards, and I can't remember, is it Ray Fulton? Who's the director of that? Is it Bob Ray Fulton? So somebody like that, and I went in to audition, and I was very young, obviously, in business, and he was, you know, talking to me, he heard of me, I'd won all these awards in theater, and I kind of had a little buzz going on, I guess, and and he called me in, and, and I sat there literally saying to him, he said, well, so tell me about yourself. And I said, well, you know, I really feel like I'm almost ready. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm studying, and I'm almost ready, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, almost ready. <laughs> I mean, I walked out of there just banging my head against the wall going, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, <laughs> telling somebody you're almost ready. There are things you can't take back, you know. There's moments that happen, and, and uh, there's a few of them, you know, so... <laughs> Now, they should all go in a book one day, I guess. Now, um, were you working those days with an agent? Yes, I, I, I did have an agent. I had a very, a, a very nice agent who really believed in me. Boy, that's great. And, and, and yeah, I had a little tiny agency with one person who just thought out the world with me, and it really, you know, it really helped me, and it helped uh, to get me going. And, and I have heard that having that good agent is the difference between uh, They don't even have them anymore, do they? I mean, I, people who submit themselves, I can't even imagine. Yeah, I, I, I can't either, you know. And I, I just don't get this business now, you know. It, 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 now, it's just too sort of separated, you know. Now, it's like um, in... in, in uh, Forgive me here, as, as you've been very forgiving of me, but uh, last Saturday night, uh, my wife had gone up to Maine. She's from Maine. Um, she was there on a, um, on a family matter, 
and uh, yeah, it is. It really is. It's uh, you know, it's the the Northeast is so diverse with so many different things with all its problems. You travel like one hour, two hours, or in some cases, you travel within the same town, and you don't think you're in the same world, let alone the same country. It's amazing. <laughs> But the um, I was watching Piranha, okay, and you can yell at me after, but I thought to myself, there was the scene where you were mauled by the fish, and I said, that had to be an incredibly physically difficult uh, part to play. The scene where I was what? Where you were mauled by the fish. No, I never got mauled by a fish. Okay. And that's your imagination. That is my imagination. Uh, but yeah, that's your imagination. I love that. That's really interesting that that is your, your impression. I actually am, uh, I have this scene where I'm being pulled away from, you know, they drag me away back underwater. Right, that's it. Um, you don't really, I mean, I had about 20 piranha fish line to me, zappers <laughs> <laughs> tape, <laughs> on my actual skin. <laughs> and and, the, and the, the fish were tied to me, so like walking out to the pool where we shot that part, not the lake in Texas, but mm-hmm. the pool in L.A., I had to carry all these like piranha, rubber piranha. <laughs> On you? Wow. <laughs> and they were pretty heavy when they were dry, you know. When we got in the water, of course, they were weightless, and, and they flopped around, and, you know, if you pushed them away, they'd come flying back at you because they were, you know, on a string, you know. You know. And, um, and anyway, when we shot it the first time, and it was their terror surfing the whole pool every, every time he supposedly gets me, and... And at the screening, this is my very first time I, I mean, at the daily, it's the first time I ever, ever even met or seen Roger Carmen. And he came in, well, I didn't meet him that day, but he came into the dailies and was like, oh, Roger, sure, Roger, sure, everybody's like, oh, my God, Roger, sure, you know. And I looked back and saw this very tall, dignified-looking man. I thought, oh, you know. And he came in, he sat down and watched the dailies. And at the end of that particular scene, he didn't even sit for the rest of them, he stood up and he said, more blood. Oh, dear. <laughs> and as he got to the door, he said, shoot it closer. And he walked out the door. So then they came to me and they're like, okay, look, can we reshoot this? I mean, like, would you, are you willing to do that? And I said, do you think I could get that billing I asked for in the first place? <laughs> That's how I got my billing, by the way. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> this this is how the sausage gets made, my dear, I see. <laughs> it's really funny. No, it's John Davison. He's such a funny man. And we, we, we laugh about it because that moment between us was really funny. And I had the sort of clarity of mind to say, wait now, <laughs> do I get the, you know? And I said, and could I have a piece of suit? instead of gaffer's tape on my skin. <laughs> so I got a body suit, and I got the billet. That's... Which is really nice. That's really great. Now, your your wife is an actress. Uh, I'm correct. Um, you're a mom. Yeah, you mentioned you were a mom. Yeah, I became a foster parent um, like 20... Well, let's see, she's 34. I got her when she was 5, so that's whatever, how many years ago, 29 years ago or something. Ah, yeah, it, and uh, she was placed in my home when she was five, and she, you know, it's one of these miraculous stories where it, they, you know, never really worked out for her to go back to her own uh, mother, and uh, in a sense, that was such a good thing because there wasn't a lot of emotional yanking and pulling, you know, and 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 she's been my daughter ever since. Now, adopted her. it's how I, I, I mean. The uh, how could I put it the the steady employment of the film business cough spit how do you how do you balance all of that and you know balance a a role as a normal person and a mother I mean how does all that tie together or does it well at that point that's when I chose to start the school be these kids and so I had a completely different kind of income and actually I did it really well mm-hmm. my business did really well I had like up to six classes running a weekend oh I see. You know, I had uh, quite a pool of kids, and uh, it, you know, it was it was a very successful business. And then I actually got an was asked to do an outside job. I was called by a private um, school for children with autism to create a uh, 
drama department for their school. And these are kids from 4 to 21, all with uh, different varying levels of autism on that spectrum. And I said, me? You want me to what? <laughs> they said, would you, you know, create a, a curriculum? And I said, okay. And so I did, and they hired me. And it just shocked me into reality. And I suddenly, you know, was thrown into working there. And I was teaching up to seven classes a day. Um, you know, and they would be usually 30 to 45 minute classes and I would come in each day with a pocket full of exercises that I was going to do in each particular class and within seconds I'd be tossing those out in the window, grabbing onto anything I could to try to make, uh, open a window in somebody's mind, you know, and, mm. um, and I mean, great nothing work. really about autism, which I think in, in truth is, is a good thing because I didn't have some conceptual box around it. Predisposed notion, I yeah. You know, I just, I just wasn't willing to accept that isn't going to work, and let's see how we can get there from here, you know. Well, predisposed and notions, had yeah. had some wonderful breakthroughs with so many kids there. And, um, I did that for three years, and, and so that was outside source of any plus I was doing. <laughs> I was teaching BB's kids on the weekend, doing that on uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then Tuesday and Thursdays, I was driving all the way out into West Covina to do uh, after-school programs for kids. And <laughs> you know, you just supplement. I mean, I had lots of energy. I still do, but I'm like an antique now, you know. And, and No, you're not, the but okay. Energy is, but yeah. it's good. I paint. I use it to paint with. Yeah, now tell us about the painting and the authorship. Well, um, are you talking about which? What are you talking about in authorship? Because now, and you had mentioned you wanted to do a book. Well, I, I I've been writing with a writing partner a book about Iran, a young Persian girl uh, from Iran, and we've been writing for about seven or eight years, and you know it's an, it's still unfinished. Okay, um, both of our lives kind of took different turns, and you know so we're sort of at that place right now. In the meantime, uh, many years ago, uh, 30 years or so ago, I shot a lot of rock and roll. And uh, in between my my jobs, which, you know, feel like a year goes by before you get another job. I understand. Like, you know, it didn't, but it felt like that, you know. And and so I ha one of my, you know, I always hung out with, uh, my mother was a musician, so I always seemed to be around musicians. and. My friend was the uh, sound engineer for Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and he was just like one of my best friends. Actually, he's a friend of my ex, and he and I became big friends. And uh, and he used to, he didn't like to drive to, to places alone when they were playing, and he'd say, hey, listen, you know, the CSN's playing up in Santa Barbara, why don't you drive up with me, you know? Mm -hmm. And me, I can't sit still for five minutes, so I'd always bring my camera, you know? So he'd give me a press pass, and I'd just, you know, I'd shoot and have a good time, and, Nobody ever saw my pictures, and I never did anything with them, and I just loved shooting, right? <laughs> and then, one day, my friend, Don Gooch, died, and um, uh. he'd been asking me for 20 years to put a book together. He kept saying, your shots are fabulous. You know, you put a book together. I'm like, are you crazy? I'm standing next to Henry Dolph. I mean, I can't put a book together. You know, these, these really incredible, you know, photographers, I mean, major rock and roll photographers are standing next to me. I'm not going to be the one to put it. You know, I'm an actor. I can't do this, right? And but when he passed, I, it drove me back to looking at all these 30 years of pictures that I took with him. And um, I said, oh, my God, am I crazy or what? And, of course, my, they were slides, and they were starting to mildew. I had, you know, a couple of them start to mildew, and I said, hey, you better, like, do or die now. You know? I understand. So I digitized, digitized them and sat here from two to four in the morning, you know, pretty learning how to put them into these templates, you know, and created this book and made a print of it. And I'm walking around with this demo book, you know, trying to find a publisher now. Boy, that's great. And then the painting. All the concerts, all the concerts that we did, you know, because Crosby, Stills, and Nash, they just gave their love and their music and their time to all these various causes and you know and, and where they where they went usually they brought Bonnie Raitt and James Taylor and Jackie mm -hmm. Brown and, you know there were groups that kind of did these causes so the whole 
something is called Rockin' the Causes. That's the name of my uh, wow. book. And I, you know, want to get back to a cause, and I'm still trying to figure out which one that is. Perhaps autism. Well, that's the one that keeps coming up yeah. for me. I, I want to, I was thinking of the veterans for a long time, you know, and, 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 and yet I work so hard with these kids, and I, you know, so it pulls me. And I, you know, I'm just not sure. I'm, I'm probably, if the right publisher would probably have a preference, you know, too, you know, that, that we can discuss. I'm still open about it, you know. Now the painting, uh, is there a type of painting you like that you feel? Everything, everything, I gobble everything up. I paint everything all the time, <laughs> I just went crazy. I mean, literally, I think like 45 paintings a day. Well, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to suggest this to you, and I'd be pleased, uh, my wife and I would be pleased to be your, your guides to this, should ever you come to the East. But uh, New Haven, Connecticut, where we have an office which uh, did not make very favorable national news this week, um, and it's kind of like uh, there still are good things, and one of the good things is the whole Yale University uh, art collection that's, uh, believe me, I could walk there in five minutes from the building where we're at, and it's, and Belinda, it's these beautiful 1,500, 1,400, 1,600, and they are in absolutely pristine, beyond the pale, mint condition, and, and someone like you, I think you'd get lost in there, we'd have to come find you. Uh-huh, probably, yeah, I mean, that's exactly true. <laughs> well, but let me know, if ever you want to come east, I can, uh, you know, as my father would say, we'd, we'd, pour, out, we'd pour out the welcome mat. <laughs> well, Ohio is nowhere near Connecticut, so it No, it isn't. No, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think you might be able to these days, um, because like the local airport in New Haven, they keep talking about expanding it, but there's neighborhoods and environment and things like that. I think they have a daily that goes from Cincinnati to New Haven, and you might yeah, want to look no, at that. I already have a return flight. I mean, it's, you know, they book you in and book you out. So, um, and, but, you know, at some point or another, I might end up there. I mean, I loved it when I, I did this uh, play with Don Knotts back in mm -hmm. 1977 called, that was written for him called A Good Look at Tony Kern, and I put this blind girl who, um, when she meets him, she thinks he's, you know, something else anyway it's a love story and, and it's, it's a very romantic story and and here Don is so well you know known for his comedy and every single night even the Bucks County uh, when he would knock on the door and I would open the door you know blind and he would there he'd be standing there the audience would go into uncontrollable laughter which hmm. drove Don nuts by the way. <laughs> no, no, it really did. It irritated him so much, you know, but because this wasn't a comic comedic moment. This was, you know, yeah. and, and yet we'd stand there staring at each other, me blind and him irritated, for sometimes up to nine minutes while the audience wow. tried to pull it back together. And neither of us could speak because we, we would have been through the first act without anybody hearing us. But that's how people reacted to Don. They would just start laughing. And it was so endearing and so sweet, and he was so sweet about it, and so used to it. And by finally, about ten minutes in, the audience got into the play, and by the end of it, you know, they were in tears. And, and he's such a, he was such an amazing actor, and hardly given the I know, and, and, and you don't really give him the credit for that. No, it's he, really was, he wanted so badly to be the dramatic actor that he was. Yeah. And, but he never got to because he was so friggin' funny, you know. He really was. In our closing moments together, what was your favorite role? Well, you mean in film? Or yeah, the one, the, the, the one like, the uh, you, yeah, the, the one you liked the most that you felt did the best for you. Um, <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to just talk about Joe Dante films then because I would say the Howling or Piranha, you mm -hmm. know, were was probably the most fun and the most um, rewarding career-wise, you know. Yeah. Television-wise, I'd have to say an after-school special I did called Are You My Mother with Michael York mm -hmm. or Proud Men with Charlton Heston and Peter Strauss. Is there a role that um, either, oh, how could I put it, either something you auditioned for 
uh, that you didn't get or maybe something that was out of your time zone uh, either earlier than later than your active career saying where you said to yourself man if I had that I really could have done something with it and I could have done a lot better than the person who was doing it do you have anything like that there's lots of those. Oh, dear. You know, I mean, I had five auditions for um, A Heart Like a Wheel, okay? Ah. Wow. Bonnie Bedelia. Yeah, the Bonnie Bedelia, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I realized when I saw her performance, oh, my God, we played it completely opposite of each other. She played it very cold and very, you know, uh, hard-driven. I played it just hot passion. Like, I was a jockey. I, I was born on the racetrack. I don't know what racing is, you know. I mean, I had this, this fire. I was playing it pure fire, and she was playing it pure ice. And it was so interesting to see that she got the part at that wow, I was so shocked, you know. Mm-hmm. I would very much love to have played that part. That was, like, because of my father, I guess, because of my whole life, you know, as growing up around racing. It's the same kind of... Um, the, the same kind of passion and fever yeah, and fervor. Really it's yeah, it's a different thundering of the post, you know? <laughs> well, Belinda, you have been an absolute joy and an absolute doll, and I'm so happy you were able to spend this time with us today. Where uh, can our friends and fans keep an eye on what you're doing and keep in touch with you? Facebook is always good. I was asked that question actually at a Q&A with... Uh, I go to and D Wallace and all. They asked, they asked me, my question was, uh, when did you find out that these films were done had become classics and that you had this fan base? And I looked out at this audience of people from 20 to 70, and I said, Facebook? And the whole Yeah, world what, what's that? Out. Yeah. <laughs> because a minute before Facebook, I had not a clue. Mm-hmm. So it's a very, that's it's a very good way to. Get yeah, it's how you and I met. So that's that's it's true. that's yeah. certainly. Well, listen, you have a great day in Southern California. Thank you so very much, and uh, we will uh, we'll have you back to continue this from time to time. You've been most gracious and kind uh, to thank come you. on my humble show, and thank you so ever have much. A very good day. Yeah, you too. Take care now. Okay. Bye. Bye. This proves the defendant is not guilty. Smoke is the air man. A young man already influencing others. Smoke is the air man. A man with a thirst for excitement. A man with a thirst for a manlier group. How can you like that? We raise an ale. Ale? What beer? Time you got to know ale. A man's taste grows up when he does. That's when he appreciates Valentine Ale. Isn't it just like beer? Well, it's like like beer. But what a difference. Smell that aroma. That will tell you. Hey, real tangy. And that's how it tastes. Older, keener, more to the point. You know, I can send another. Who is the ale man? Eat with me, you have drink the older, keener, tasting brew. Valentine Ale. Try Valentine Ale. You'll be an ale man, too. Thank you, girls. That was great. The babe ought to be proud of you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, coming into the studio, it's the great babe Ruth himself. Come on, babe. Hey, what is this? What am I supposed to do here? You're supposed to tell these millions of people listening in just what you're going to do on the air. Well, I can't tell a crowd if I can't see. Oh, say there's nothing to it. Babe, go right to it. It's easy. I'll bet you can do it. Oh, well, hello, folks. My two friends and myself have written a number called The Home Run on the Key. We're jumping into the studio like this a sudden. Why, we figure we got two strikes on us already. But remember, you only have one to hit. So, David, play it. Okay.
Those of you who follow this show know that I am a fan of the Word of the Day, a tradition that was started years back by the late, great DJ Dan Ingram on WABC Radio in New York. Today's Word of the Day is Antagonist, and this is a man who comes to your house when all of those creepy crawly things are getting out of control, and man, you got to do something about them. people to thank today. First of all, our wonderful guest, Belinda Belosky. Just great lady to talk to. Had a lot of fun with Belinda and man, what a great time that was. We've also got our retro commercials of Valentine Beer. Babe Ruth doing his musical interlude from 1937. Dan Ingram. And all of you guys who are the faithful listeners who come back every day and the wonderful Dusty Springfield singing Don't Forget About Me. And I mean that, Don't Forget About Me, because I'm going to come back next week with a show that you're really going to like. So, for Tony D'Angelo, Belinda Belaski, and for the comfortably zoned radio network, all the stations up and down the coast out of Alameda, California... In the words of Dan Ingram, Kayuska Day, we will see you next week. Have a great week, everybody. God bless. Thanks for being here.